Welcome to the Visually Hidden Selects podcast, where we discuss an independent approach to the art of cinema and explore the subtext of various featured films. My name is Peter O'Brien, and I am an independent filmmaker, author, and musician. My name is David Bendler. I'm a film and stage actor and a pop culture enthusiast. I'm Anne Milleville, a French screenwriter and producer. Today's selection is Into the Wild from 2007, directed by Sean Penn. And this movie, I first saw it in the theater. I had heard about it prior to its release. It came out when I was in college. And so I had a friend who was reading the book like the year before. And, you know, we would sit and we would talk about what we were reading. He told me and he told me the whole story you know, straight up. And if you have not read the book and you want to read the book, or if you have not seen the movie, I suggest you go check out the VHS episode and then go watch the movie and then come back to the podcast because we will be talking about it openly. There will be spoilers. So you've been warned. And moving forward, my friend told me about the whole story. He's like, yeah, it's about a guy who goes and, you know, lives in the wild and then he, uh, you know, dies in a bus. It's like, oh, okay, then. Well, Thanks. I guess I'll, uh, you know, I guess I can pass that one by. But then when the movie came out, I had forgotten and he never told me the name of it. He just told me what it was about. So then I saw the trailer. and I was like, wow, this movie looks pretty awesome. And like the cinematography, even in the trailer, really stood out to me. I was like, I want to go see that. That looks like a great adventure. And then I went and saw it. and I was like, this is that movie he was talking. Oh, <laughs> shit. But it's still like, even though I knew the ending, like it, it was no less impactful for me because again it's about the journey it's about the adventure and it's about the life lived not the tragic circumstances in which it ended so for me it was a very impactful experience that wasn't hindered by being spoiled and when i saw it i i really connected with it because i was about the same age as chris mccandless when the movie came out i was really able to like lose myself in that character it wasn't like i was a kid watching die hard and like oh i can't wait to grow up and be you know super cop you know i was this young man who was just at this point this crossroad in their life where it's like you can go this way or you can go this way you can do this or you can do that and i chose to kind of mix it up as opposed to like fully commit that's my experience with this film initially I had seen this film just once before, I think shortly after it came out. The only things I remembered uh, of it was um, the journey, as you said, in the tragic end. So I didn't really remember all the characters coming up in his life. Watching it again, I, I enjoyed watching it a second time, but um, I didn't have the same experience. I, I don't feel the same way you, you felt uh, knowing the end. I think um, when you don't know the end, you you have so much hope for him. Uh, you want him to achieve his goal and you think it's going to be a happy end. I mean, I felt that way the first time I watched it. The second time you, yeah, I don't know, you, you want it to, you want the movie to last as long as possible because you don't want to see the end. And um, even if it's a beautiful end when you think about it, but... It's so tragic. You have so much hope for, for this poor guy. So yeah, watching it a second time was a difficult experience in a way. Uh, I started to cry maybe too early. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's, it's such a beautiful movie. Um, the landscape and as you said, the cinematography, it's um, just for that, you should watch it anyway. So yeah, I saw this movie one time before and, you know, I had mixed feelings about it at the time and I still have mixed feelings about it now. There's so much that I, I appreciate about the movie. The first time I watched it, I remember I was, I was very engaged. I was locked in and around the halfway mark, I started to feel like uh, frustrated with his character. This time, this viewing of it, I felt, uh, I walked away thinking he was more selfish in, in, in some of his actions. Um, then I, I didn't, I didn't feel that way the first time, the first time I, I was caught off guard. I didn't know that he was going to die. Cause I, I didn't read the book. I knew nothing about it. I had wanted to see it in the theater. I just, one of those that I just didn't, you know, I missed it. Um, and I, cause I really love Emil Hirsch. I think he's a great actor. I you know, love mm -hmm. John Penn. So I was like, this is, you know, and all the supporting people, I love all those people. Um, and I was like, this is, this is a, this is a movie for me and I missed it, but I, I, watching it, I was, it was like, Oh out of left field he dies in the fucking bus but i remember feeling angry about it 
I know there's a whole thing about finding yourself and going on this journey and, and living the life you want under the conditions that you want, but then there's also a reality to the world. And I had frustrations with it the first time. I have frustrations even talking about it now, but I had frustrations watching it the first time. The second time, I still had those frustrations, but I feel like I was able to zero in my feelings about whatever bothered me the first time, I could zero in on why it bothered me now. I'm surprised that you feel frustrated that he acts stupidly or or he acts like selfishly because that's part of it. I mean, when you were young, I guess you did stupid things and selfish things. And I think it's part of it because what I like about this movie, it speaks to many of us. I think many of us, we one day we thought that, okay, I want to quit everything and live my life and, and try the real freedoms, experience the, the real freedom. But Of course, most of us, we think of the consequences. You think that you're going to affect your, your friends and family. So you don't do it. You think it's, it's quite a stupid thing. And that's what he does. He does something that quite everybody wants to do. He, he has the balls to do it. You know what I'm saying? So yes, it's selfish. But maybe to be free, it's kind of selfishness. Because if we're not free, if we keep um, working in a society with rules and codes and things like that, It's because you think of the community and, and people around you. So, yeah, it's selfish, but it's part of it. I mean, it's part of the experience in a way. I felt that way. Well, yeah. I think I think there's more to it than even that. You know, one of, one of the big uh, things that stuck out to me in this film is the relationship between Chris and his parents and that family dynamic. And you hear it through the sister's narration throughout the film. And Chris makes no secret of his resentment towards his parents. And it's, you know, the, the whole story is kind of this extreme rebellion towards his parents. It's only at the end that he realizes like the, uh, the error of those ways. I find it. Yeah, I, I can see where Steve is coming from. And I kind of touched on this in the video where it's like, you know, this film is not for for people who like get frustrated at other people doing stupid shit, because of course, yeah, he's making, he's making mistakes left and right. And we have the benefit of hindsight. Chris does not have that benefit, unfortunately, but it's something also that the movie kind of takes a liberty with because of, again, like nobody was there with Chris at the end. There's still some speculation and they've done testing and whatnot to see what actually caused him to uh, die but also like he didn't prepare properly he didn't bring a map he didn't do all these things that an experienced person would do because he was again chasing the dream chasing the ideal chasing the beauty chasing the freedom chasing the romance of it and that's a big part of it so in a way it's a cautionary tale i think um and it's also I think one of the main messages is you can let everything go, but you also have to let go of that emotional baggage and that emotional resentment. And that's what he carried with him through his whole journey was that resentment towards his parents. And if he had let that go, like everything else, he could have done whatever. But I don't know. I feel like the family dynamic is is a big part of his extreme rebellion. I was trying to keep that in mind from what you said in the video about like, him going on this journey and looking for freedom and all this stuff. I'm, I'm thinking about that the entire time I'm watching it the second time around. And I don't think he was ever free at all. He had moments of freedom. He had moments where he felt at one with nature or the world or what, you know, or his being, but he, he always had that trapped by the vision, right? You know, like I, I like I have to do it this way or it doesn't count or I have to, I have to do, you know, and you, that's not freedom. You're, you're still in a box. You're still confined by your sense of what freedom is. And because he was so stringent on that and couldn't loosen up and let go of those things, like you said, the baggage, mm -hmm. it led to his demise. So like the freedom, I think for him was fleeting, but the sad part of it is that he realizes in the human connections, you feel all that stuff that he's looking for. It was like when he meets Catherine Keener and, and her husband and he Vince Vaughn and Hal Holbrook, who's heartbreaking in this movie. When you see all those interactions, like, man, this, that's it. That, you know, you could live life on your own terms and meet a lot of great people. And you, and just because you came from that family with that dynamic doesn't necessarily mean that you have to repeat it or that it's going to happen again or that you have to live like they live. 
And I feel like for someone who is so smart and so educated, how he could miss that. I think he also wanted to take that adventure. He wanted to take that journey and he wanted to test test himself. He had goals and aspirations. Like he wasn't like playing like, oh yeah, I'm going to go out there and, you know, starve to death. <laughs> All right. See you guys later. Right. Have a good one. Nice knowing you. That wasn't the plan. The plan was to go and come back and like probably reconnect with these people. You know, he stayed in touch with uh, Wayne, Vince Vaughn's character. You know, you see the correspondence throughout the movie, the writing on the screen. And he told Hal Holbrook, you know, we'll discuss it when mm -hmm. I get back about the adoption. And even even uh, Kristen Stewart's character, you know, he kind of like let her down. It's like, listen, you're not you're not ready for this yet. And I don't want to be the person like he has yeah. this sense of wisdom and this moral code and these these goals that stretch beyond the story unfortunately he just didn't get to realize them because he was carrying this other baggage and it was you know uh emotional baggage and it was kind of almost giving him like blindness to situations and only through the movie do we get the sense that maybe he realized the error of his ways at the end again we don't know what Chris actually experienced at the end. I mean, there's, right. you know, he did leave notes and, and things like that. He left a note in the bus from when he went out like foraging one day in case somebody did come along. So there are clues, but really it's between Chris and, and Chris, what happened out there. He's a young man, you know, I think you rude with him. You said he's stupid, blah, blah, blah. But for me, he's emotionally intelligent, first of all. That's why he, he can connect so easily to people he doesn't know. And I agree with you when you, you watch it with your 30 or 40 years old um, eyes, you, you think he's, he's stupid. Okay. But he, he's just 20 years old and he, he doesn't know the world. You understand that he had yeah, a violent family and maybe he, he didn't really travel before. So he has something in mind. He, think, he thinks the world is a, an adventure and he wants to take part of it. And, and you said that he's not free, but what is freedom? In a way, you know, it's it, it's complicated to to have a definition of freedom because it can depend on e each of us. Uh, we I, I'm sure the, the three of us will have a different definition of freedom. So just being outside the, the, the society and and not being part of this conception, material world, maybe for him is, is already a freedom. You know, when he burned the money and he gets rid of the, the car and everything. There was violence in his family, but it was also deceit and it was greed and it was betrayal. You know, the oh. lies that his father told him and how he had a whole other family, you know, in another part of the country. It was just that that facade, that face of like, you know, the good family and the American dream. And Alexander Christopher, he takes, you know, the almost uh, counterculture hippie approach to like, you know, F the system, stick it to the man, whatever you want to say. And he takes it to that other extreme. So it's like they're over here. I'm going all the way over here because I don't want to be anything like that. It also goes into like the things you see, the things you don't like about other people are usually the things you don't like about yourself. It's mm -hmm. one of those ideas. And so there's that one scene where Chris gets to Los Angeles and he's looking in the uh, the restaurant and he sees the guy in the suit and he's, you know, laughing and talking to a girl. And then like it turns into Chris for a minute and he's clean shaven and he's the the young business professional. And he's like, he can see himself and it like spooks him back out into into the wild. You know, he goes to the shelter and he gets his bag and he's like, yeah, you know, I'll give this bed to somebody else. I'm done. I don't, like that's. That's the fear that's driving him. And that's the baggage. And that's the thing that he's running away from because he knows he could become his father. No. And yeah. And I, I agree with that. And I'm not saying that all of the choices that Chris made were, were bad. I don't necessarily agree with all of them. And I think it, it was definitely an extremist way to go or extremist way to approach the, the situation at hand or what he deemed as a problem. You know, for example, like the, the sister character, you know, uh, I feel like he kind of just abandoned her. But he didn't plan on ending the way he did. When you love birds, you don't put them in a cage. That's my philosophy. And I feel that way. Chris is kind of a, a, of a bird and okay, his sister and him are really close, but she loves him. So she understands his, his quest of freedom. 
and him he can't stay more because he needs he needs this adve- adventure to to move on in, in his life many of us we we felt that way but we we want to stay in the cage to please other people but he had the balls to to leave the cage even if it's uh, heartbreaking for his sister and maybe for him too because he loves her too but um, sometimes you have to choose a selfish way just to to find yourself i think it was also probably a pursuit of confidence because again you have your parents kind of running or ruining your life your whole known existence you probably don't have a lot of confidence and i feel like this rebellion was was a pursuit of confidence as well and so to go out and survive on his own in the most extreme i feel like had he accomplished his goal he would have returned with an even stronger confident personality of his own identity because he he sheds his identity right he takes on his his alias of alexander supertramp like he he doesn't even know who he is and he's trying to find that person now that he's able to now that he's fulfilled his obligations to his parents with his education and everything now is his time and it's it's that journey towards becoming a new person and he just unfortunately didn't get to that conclusion even me at age 20 or 22 i don't think that i would have you know, I don't think I would have thought I'd be able to go out into the wild and live. You know what I mean? Like there, there, there would be so much I would need to know. Even now, you don't feel like doing it. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, well, now, I mean, now I wouldn't do it because it had no appeal to me. I guess it's self. I'm a big self awareness guy. Even at that age, I don't think that I would think I I'm just just gonna drop everything and head to Alaska, with, like you know, just a backpack and a you know a, a jug of water, you know. And nobody, no, that's I, that that path isn't for everybody, but. You know, you also come from a different background and you have different experiences and different goals than Chris had. And Chris, I mean, you look at the the books he was reading, like there's one scene where like he buries his books and then he returns to them when he like needs that comfort. And the book he's reading at that point is Call of the Wild. Yeah. You know, so he's reading all of these Alaskan adventure stories because he has this idea and he's reading Henry David Thoreau. Like these are the heroes that Chris looked up to when he was a young man. It's a tragedy of romanticism is really what this story is. Yeah. And now a word from our sponsor. This podcast is brought to you by Visually Hidden Selects. If you're looking for a spoiler-free recommendation of a classic film with professional analysis and insight, check out Visually Hidden Selects exclusively on the Visually Hidden YouTube channel. Me personally, story aside, I really feel like it's just an incredibly well-made film. Absolutely. And it is definitely worth watching. Whether you agree with Chris and his decisions or not, I mean, of course, I think anybody who gets to the end is not going to completely agree with Chris. (laughs) But I feel like as a film, it's an excellent film and it tells a very important story that gets people talking and gets people thinking and gets people to maybe make better decisions. And I think that's another part of this film and another point of this film. It is it, it is a cautionary tale and it is something that I think people in high school or college should experience as part of a curriculum because they are of this age and they may have similar experiences and it could lead them down better roads. You know, I watched twice the movie and um, that's something I liked in this movie is that you have kind of flashbacks all the time. So you you see the bus, then you come back from uh, when he was uh, Mm -hmm. uh, with his parents and then you come back to the bus. And I think it can be kind of confusing for some people and I totally understand that. But that's something I personally liked about this movie. That's what for me, it's one of the most uh, well-made movie I, I saw. And about the cin- cinematography, you said in the VHS episode, Pete, that um, it, it looks a European more than a Hollywood movie. And I totally agree with that. And I wanted mm-hmm. to know if one of you, you watch another Sean Penn movie, because I thought, actually, I thought it was his first one. So I checked on the internet, it wasn't. The, oh. I mean, the first one he directed, no, it wasn't. His- Yeah. uh, Sean Penn, his first film as a director was The Indian Runner in 1991. And then he did The Crossing Guard with Jack Nicholson in 1995. The Pledge with Jack Nicholson in 2001. And then Into the Wild in 2007. And then he's done subsequent films as well. But those are those are some of his earlier films leading up to this one. I was really um, surprised by uh, his direction. It's a fantastic movie. That's why I asked you if you if you saw another Sean Penn's movie because um, 
clearly I, I want to see another one. And um, this movie, Into the Wild, was a huge success here in France and I guess in Europe. But um, about Sean Penn also, uh, as I said, when we talked about Bad Boys, I don't really know this guy. He's not quite famous here. I mean, we know him as an actor, but we, his movies are not super famous here. So I saw Bad Boys, I saw uh, The Tree of Life, and I think that's all. And yeah, I think Sean Penn did a, a fantastic and phenomenal job with the direction. Yes, top to bottom. The movie is beautiful to look at. I mean, there's never a boring shot. And I agree with Anne. I, I think that if he tried to tell the story linear, it wouldn't have the same effect. It wouldn't be It wouldn't be as impactful. I think one of the, the, the joys of watching the movie for me is I, I loved and I believed every one of the relationships. Yeah. Like Emil Hirsch, when he interacts with all these different people, I believed every one of them. Mm -hmm. And for me, believability goes a long, long way. Because if I don't believe the situation, I tune out real quick. And I, I start looking at everything else but that. And I just, I was very engrossed in all those relationships, both viewings. And I think that might have to do with the fact that Tr Sean Penn's a tremendous actor. So, you know, creating a situation where these other actors can can thrive and, and see a really well thought out relationship or, you know, because he did the script also. So th I think that that combination really served the movie well. I was really surprised by um not not so much Vince Vaughn because he's he's dabbled in drama here and there but uh Zach Galifianakis you know he's usually <laughs> he's usually the horse's ass of yeah. the situation whether intentional or not you know I don't know if you guys have ever seen besides his of course you know breakthrough in the hangover but he did this uh show between two ferns yes where he would sit down with a celebrity and then just like berate them or ask them like idiotic questions or like underhanded slights and mm -hmm. uh, things like that. And it's the joke. But here he's saying some kind of funny things, but it's it's delivered so straight. I didn't even realize it was him for like, yeah. you know, maybe maybe two or three viewings, because again, like this came out in 2007 before The Hangover. And it's just I think he does a, a very underrated job. And even the guy who played Rainey, he's not a professional actor. I think he was the, like Emil Hirsch's like kayaking coach. <laughs> Brian Deeker is the actor who played Rainey and he just does a fantastic job. And I, I, you know, I feel like their relationship and their connection is really, really strong. And that might be part of it too, is like Emil Hirsch as, as an actor could see like, Oh, I can, I can utilize this relationship to, to my benefit in this film. Yeah. Like, you know, maybe maybe we can we can work this out on screen as opposed to behind the scenes, you know, because I feel like what I read in the script of this character, this guy has. And to try to create it with another actor will just take some of the wind out of the sails, like when this guy already has it. So if he's up to it, like and he did a great job. I mean, that's one of my favorite supporting characters and one of my favorite uh, relationships that Chris has in the film, along with Hal Holbrook, mm -hmm. who Oh my God. I love Hal Holbrook. When the film got to the point with Hal Holbrook's character, Ron, coming in, I was like, oh, <laughs> I had like a joygasm in the theater that I had to stifle because it was it was Hal Holbrook. Yeah. And yeah, he's old and he's frail, but he's still Hal Holbrook. Yeah. Always, and he's great. Always a joy to see from, from Creepshow to this, to his little, you know, his little one-off in The Sopranos to, you know, I mean, anything that guy does is just a joy. And I, I was surprised that um, Emil Hirsch, the, the, the main character, is not more known. Uh, I don't know any of his uh, other movies. And this guy definitely deserved a, an Oscar. His performance is uh, mind-blowing in, in this movie, uh, especially at a young age, because I guess he was quite the same age as the main character, so 20 years old. And um, yeah, fantastic cast. The film is based on the book and the book is a very well-researched piece of nonfiction. And so the author of the book, he kind of backtracked Chris's path and his journey. And he met all of these people and got their testimony for his book to build the impression and the character of Chris so the reader could understand who Chris actually was and what he was looking for and pursuing and what was driving him. And the film really hones in on that as well. I mean, the uh, the opening of the film when Chris gets dropped off 
by the guy in the pickup truck and he gives him the boots and tells him if you make it out of there, my number's in the boots. That's the guy who actually drove the real Chris to that point. Oh, wow. Jim Gillian. Yeah, Jim Gillian. He's the guy who dropped off the real Chris in 1992 when he went on his journey. Wow. So it's, you know, that level of authenticity, that level of respect to the story and to to the life of Chris. I feel like this film kind of goes above and beyond in terms of a biopic, because not only does it tell the story well and in an engaging way, we talked a little bit about the the editing and like the cutting back and forth. And I feel like this film utilizes that cross cutting element and nonlinear storytelling exceptionally well to keep it engaging for the audience. I agree. Well, one point we haven't talked about yet, and I think we should at least mention Eddie Vedder and the music in this movie, I think is mm. pretty damn good. It adds a very earthy, earnest tone to the film. Yeah, the uh, the music really does kind of tie it all together and it, it accents it. He's really kind of just uh, telling a story that yeah. complements the story. And so when they when they combine... It's uh, it just makes it more powerful. The music for me, it's also something that um, make it looks like a European movie, even if the the composers are not European. But uh, that's something we do a lot in European movies. You have very slow moments, and you have the music to make it like a journey during the movie, uh, and you can really identify the scenes by the music also. So um, yeah, that's something uh, a European touch. And it's it's non-conventional, you know, it would have been so easy to like have an an orchestral score with these like big dramatic movements and things like that. But it's it's not the character of Chris. It's it's super focused and it's super clear and it's super direct and it's very, very, very personal. And I think that is something that like, just ties in to the whole big picture of the the story in the film. I feel like there's a rich mine here cinematically yeah. that can be explored more than just surface superficial entertainment value and, and the character actions. I feel like there's a lot coming together in this particular film that, that people could benefit from. I, I agree with that a thousand percent. And if I'm being completely honest, the first time I watched the movie at the end, I remember saying to myself, I'm never watching this again. And not because it was a, a bad movie, not because it was poorly made. I, I said I would never watch it again because I was sad about the outcome, because it was a real person, and I was angry about the choices he made. And it wasn't, like I said, it wasn't because like, oh, this is, a, fuck, this is an awful movie. It wasn't. It's, it's the farthest thing from an awful movie. I just, I was very sad, and I was very angry, and I was just like, I don't, I don't want to do this again. You know, some, some emotional punches to the gut I can take over and over again. And this is one I just didn't want to do again. And when I saw it on the list, I was like, oh, fuck. <laughs> All right. Well, and I was putting it off to like the last minute of watching this again. But I, you know what? I'm glad I did because I forgot about all the, the good points, you know, that mm -hmm. we had mentioned, you know, during this conversation. And I'm glad that I revisited it. You know, I don't know that I'll do it again anytime soon. That's not saying that I would never watch it again. Because if someone wanted to watch it with me, I'd sit and I'd watch it with them. But yeah, it still makes me very sad. Absolutely. It's that awareness is the goal of the film. Like, yeah. listen, life is precious and we all have our baggage, but don't don't let yours weigh you down. I, I had a similar experience with a movie, American History X. I love that movie. And we get we get to the end of that movie and I did not want to watch that movie ever again. But you know what? You start thinking about it and you start thinking about the whole movie and the big picture. And then it becomes a thing of like that it had that kind of an effect and that kind of an impact. Like, no, I do want to go back because and I'm not going to like it like anytime <laughs> I see it, but yeah. to like study it. And it's like, why did that affect me so much? You know, like I cried like a baby. I haven't watched it in a number of years, but I subsequently did purchase it on VHS and DVD. Mm -hmm. You know, it's one that uh, I, I did watch pretty regularly for a while to just study. And I feel like Into the Wild, it has that, you know, same thing. And I mean, 
even Shakespeare are tragedies. Yeah, <laughs> they are not happy endings in in a lot of those stories. Uh, but people continue to visit them centuries later, and so I feel like there's there's definitely a value in a in a tragedy. And you know, a lot of people watch a movie for the escapism, for the adventure, for the you know like oh I'm going to get out of my life and I'm going to go I'm going to go be a Terminator for two hours or I'm going to go be you know a pirate for two hours or whatever. And it's like I don't want to be a 20 year old who dies in the forest alone for two hours. That's horrible, but. You know, there's something to be said about that journey and about the pursuit and the fact that it was a real person. Yeah. For me, there's um, there's a lot of lessons to be taken from this, and there are things that you can employ in your life for a benefit from this story. Yeah, I agree. I can't. I can't disagree at that point. I had the same feeling as as Steve in a way that the first time I watched it, I didn't want to watch it again, not for the same reasons, but I had so much hope for this guy. <laughs> the first time I watched the movie, I, I really thought it's going to be a happy end because I knew it was a biography. So I thought uh, if they tell the story, it's because he had a good experience, you know, so <laughs> when you see how it, it, it ends, um, yeah, I, did, I didn't really want to, to watch it again, but for this podcast, I did it and I Actually, as uh, Steve said, I was happy to do so because then I focused on the um, human relations. And, um, you know, I, I didn't remember the hippie couple or Vince Vaughn. Actually, it's a, it, it's a surprise because in my mind, this guy, I know, Steve, you like him. But for me, he's an what? actor of bad comedies. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. And, um, that's and, and that's a, that's a actually, cultural thing steve don't take offense <laughs> that's the french in me <laughs> talking but no um <laughs> and actually i i already saw him in this movie i didn't remember and yeah actually it's a great performance and he's really better in those kind of movies actually i feel that way one of my favorite parts of this movie is when he's working at Burger King and his manager comes up to him and says, listen, Chris, I really want to help you. I want to help you get to Alaska, but you got to start wearing socks. And it's <laughs> that one scene that's his rebellious nature. Yeah. Like encapsulated. And that's that to me is a snapshot of the entire movie and the entire character in that scene is like, Psh! there he is. That's Christopher McCandless, Alexander Supertramp. Pete, I have to point out, I, th I think you have a type. You have this, The Razor's Edge. I think you have a type of film that you really gravitate towards. Yeah, I tend to gravitate towards personal pursuit movies, you know, and I, I like a lot of prison movies, and that goes with Clockwork Orange and Escape from New York and Bad Boys. <laughs> but then there's also these like very deep personal movies like It's a Wonderful Life and The Razor's Edge and Into the Wild. Two of my favorite movies are It's a Wonderful Life and A Clockwork Orange. So dissect that however you want. But that's, you know, when you when you meet in the middle, that's where I am. And I see it in your work. I mean, listen, Misery Loves Company, you know, the, the National Geographic vibe that you that that, mm -hmm. you know, your character um, appreciates in that movie is here in spades in Into the Wild. And then the personal mm -hmm. journey, you know, of Misery Loves Company. So, you know, the, you know I can see the uh, the impact on your work. Not going to deny it. <laughs> you found me out and it's a that's a good thing it's not a bad thing it's a, it's a good thing no it is a good thing because like that's and that's you know one of the reason why i pick these movies is these are the movies i these are the visually hidden selects these are the ones that i want to share with the world because they are something that have impacted me or have impacted my work or the work that we do here and so like when you're watching it and then you watch our films you might see some parallels or some inspiration. I never, I don't like the word influence. I prefer inspiration because that's something that made me think about this. And so now I'm going to follow this idea that I had. Like Misery Loves Company, there's a lot of things that came into play on that. And one of the things that came into play on that is uh, actually a song by the police called uh, Can't Stand Losing You. That's a great song. You go listen to that song and then you watch Misery Loves Company. And you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> and... There's elements in that song that are incorporated into the story of Misery Loves Company in addition to half a million other things. So I agree with the word inspiration. You know, uh, there's a, you know, there's a, a situation in The Sopranos. I won't say what it is, but um, it plays out a certain way. I, it inspired me to write a one act. It's like, what happens if I take that similar situation and just play it the opposite way? How does that turn out? And you're not using the Soprano characters. You're using your characters, yeah. but you're like just taking that idea, that seed and that 
you know, takes you on a different branch. So yeah, yeah it's great. And I think that's, that's the cool thing, you know, and I think that's what movies are missing unless you've have an original story to tell, or if you found a really cool book that covers something that hasn't been done, take the inspiration from something that you love and do something unique with it. And then we'll get something new to appreciate. Well, and I think that's what Chris was trying to do. Honestly, he was taking the inspiration from the things he loved and trying to find a life that he could enjoy and a, a path that he he would feel happy and proud about as opposed to the uh, overbearingness of his family. So yeah. I feel like, yeah, it's the, it's the same thing. So I think that about does it for us here today at the Visually Hidden Selects podcast. We'll be discussing a brand new movie in the next episode. So be sure to head over to the Visually Hidden YouTube channel and subscribe so you don't miss that selection and our subsequent conversation. You can catch Steven Bendler over at Steve's Pop Culture Corner on Instagram. Anne and I are also on Instagram as well as Letterboxd. So you can follow us over there and check out what we've been watching and see what we think. Until next time, stay out of the wild.